Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much to the organizing committee for having invited me to be here in person. It's really a pleasure, after three years of not being able to travel, to meet uh, colleagues one-on-one. Uh, uh, -on -one. Um, so I'm essentially a basic science uh, researcher that has uh, now our, the work come to a point of translational application. So I will describe a little bit of both. Basic science approach to understanding the structure and function of alkaline phosphatase and uh, how we've been able to translate that into therapies for, so, for soft bones diseases and also ectopic calcification diseases. So um, the, this is the outline of my talk. I will divide it in three parts. First, a little bit of how we have used animal models models deficient in one or the other isozyme to understand how they all participate in controlling inorganic pyrophosphate, and then moving on to how we've used that knowledge to, towards the treatment of hypophosphatasia and now towards the treatment of um, ectopic calcification diseases um, epitomized by pseudosantoma elasticum in this case. So, the, the system that we use is the growth plate. This is the area of the long bones that, that the long bones use to essentially expand uh, at the, in, during, the growth, uh, during the growth phase uh, of, of uh, adolescence. And these cells, hypertrophic chondrocytes, I don't know if I have a pointer here, these hypertrophic chondrocytes essentially bleb out these small bags of enzymes called matrix vesicles right here, and this is where calcification starts. And we've been interested in trying to understand how calcification starts within these matrix vesicles. This is what they look like under the microscope. These matrix vesicles were essentially co-discovered by Clark Anderson in the US and Hermano Bonucci in Italy in the 60s. These are images from our own work, uh, actually from, from René Boucher's work here in Lyon. Uh, this is what they look like under, in, under the microscope. And in these vesicles is where calcium and phosphate come together to to initiate mineralization. And here I also want to introduce immediately inorganic pyrophosphate, two molecules of phosphate linked together by an oxygen group. This is a very potent inhibitor of mineralization. It suppresses the initiation of mineralization as well as the propagation of mineralization. So very important to have pyrophosphate concentrations in check, under control. So the first phase, and here I show you an image of uh, a, a mineral growing within the matrix vesicles, taken by my collaborator Massimo Bottini, uh, both in, in Rome and in La Jolla. Beautiful crystal growing inside these matrix vesicles. Then these crystals essentially grow beyond the confines of the matrix vesicles. They puncture through the vesicles, destroying the vesicles, becoming exposed to the extracellular matrix. And, uh, and then these this, uh, crystals, hydroxyapatite crystals, propagate onto the collagenous fibers. Throughout this entire process, you have essentially pyrophosphate essentially slowing down the, pro the process they, as, a, as a control of the rate of mineralization. So fundamentally important to keep pyrophosphate concentrations in check. You really need to be in the green zone to have controlled calcification. And if you have too much inhibitor, then you have soft bones. Then you have hypomineralization of the skeleton and teeth um, because it suppresses initiation and propagation of mineralization. And if you have too little, now you have your soft tissues calcified, ectopic mineralization. And in fact, uh, inorganic pyrophosphine has been called um, the water softener of the body. This is the mechanism of defense that prevents all our soft tissues from calcifying. And only when you have the, the, the enzymes that destroy pyrophosphate, it allows calcification to proceed in the skeleton and in teeth. That is the basic, the basic mechanism. So we spent a number of years trying to understand how pyrophosphate uh, is controlled. And when I talk about pyrophosphate, I will switch to talking about the phosphate-pyrophosphate ratio or the pyrophosphate to phosphate ratio because both are really linked together. Uh, you have phos phosphate in the millimolar range. You have pyrophosphate in the micromolar range. So a small change in pyrophosphate has a huge implication in the ratio of phosphate to pyrophosphate. So we tend to talk about the, the pyrophosphate to phosphate ratio. And this is how essentially the whole process takes place. Initiation of mineral Mineralization within matrix vesicles is a dual mechanism. You have for first formation of phosphate within the matrix vesicles by the action of phospho-1, an enzyme that uses phosphocholine to form phosphate. And this phosphocholine comes from sphingomyelin by the action of SMPD3. This is one mechanism. 
The other mechanism is incorporation of phosphate via P2, uh, phosphate transporters, P1, P2. And this phosphate essentially needs to be generated perivesicularly by the action of either tissue non-specific alkaline phosphatase that uses ATP or paraphosphate for phosphate production, or alternatively also by the action of ENPP1, the enzyme primarily responsible for the formation of paraphosphate, but at the level of matrix vesicles, it acts as a backup phosphatase, and it can also produce phosphate. And then, so this explains essentially initiation here and essentially a, a, a propagation up to the stage where uh, the crystals per, uh, per puncture through the membrane. And then outside is really all the action of alkaline phosphatase, tissue non-specific alkaline phosphatase, cleaving pyrophosphate to allow mineralization to proceed onto, the, onto collagenous fibers. Osteopontin also comes into play because in, osteopontin is a very potent inhibitor of mineralization as well. To 200-fold more potent than paraphosphate on a molar basis, and it happens to also be a substrate of alkaline phosphatase. So only phosphorylated osteopontin inhibits mineralization. Dephosphorylated osteopontin does not. So the level of alkaline phosphatase is important for the level of phosphorylation of osteopontin, and it affects also how propagation of hydroxyapatite takes place in the extracellular matrix. So I will show you some of the evidence that led us to this understanding. Essentially, here I'm summarizing almost 20 years of work uh, through the examination of one or the other animal models, knockout animal models, and I will show you some of the data to illustrate the pathology, and then we'll move into, into the clinical uh, elements of that. Um, so, uh, EMPP1, now let's go back here. So the alkaline phosphatase deficiency, what happens if we knock out alkaline phosphatase? Well, this is the phenotype. You essentially have soft tissues, soft, soft bones, inappropriate mineralization of the, of the skeleton, lack of secondary ossification centers, uh, abnormalities, craniofacial abnormalities, uh, abnormalities in the tooth organ, uh, you have problems in the denting, lack of acellular cementum, problem in the enamel, all the, all the tooth organ layers are affected by the lack of alkaline phosphatase. I'll be mentioning my collaborators throughout the talk so I don't forget anyone. This work has been done in collaboration with Mark McKee at McGill, Brian Ian Foster uh, and Martha Sommerman, um, fantastic collaborators on all the tooth aspect of, of our work. So this is the phenotype when you lack alkaline phosphatase. We'll come back to this because this is essentially what happens in hypophosphatasia. These are the primary defects in hypophosphatasia. We'll get back to this. What happens if we knock out ENPP1? This was done in collaboration with Bob Turkletop at UCSD. Uh, here you have soft tissue calcification. You have low levels of paraphosphate. So your skin calcifies, uh, your uh, ligaments of the spine calcify, their tendons calcify, and your vasculature calcifies. And in fact, EMPP1 deficiency leads to generalized arterial calcification of infancy, a quite a, a very severe uh, uh, disease. And that is all due to low levels of paraphosphate. You're lacking the enzyme that produces paraphosphate. So we argue uh, uh, early on what would happen if we were to combine the two knockout animal models, one lacking alkaline phosphatase that destroys paraphosphate, one lacking ENPP1 that forms paraphosphate. Would we normalize the levels of paraphosphate? And indeed, it happened. And you see here that essentially osteoblastic cells double knockout behave like wild-type cells. And we have improvement, particularly in the axial skeleton, uh, not so much in the appendicular skeleton, but in the axial skeleton we have normalization of mineralization, at least for a few days. The, the animals still die uh, perinatally, but that's uh, for, for another reason. But essentially we can, by controlling paraphosphate, we can recover the proper mineralization of the skeleton. This was done by, by my postdoc, Lufisa Hesley. And the reason why the axial skeleton doesn't correct very well is because of the levels of, of the two enzymes. You essentially need equimolar concentrations of alkaline phosphate is the EMPP1 to achieve the correction. And when you don't have that ratio uh, adequately in the axial skeleton, you don't have proper correction. Uh, with Clark Anderson, one, the co-discoverer of matrix vesicles, we found that in the alkaline phosphatase knockout matrix vesicles, you still have mineral inside the vesicles, but you lack mineralization in the extracellular matrix. So it is really propagation of mineralization that is defective, not initiation. This made us think that there must be another enzyme producing phosphate within the matrix vesicles, and that led us to work with uh, Colin Farquharson, 
um, who had discovered phospho-1, and Manisha Yadao in my laboratory did this work, knocked out phospho-1, and you see essentially osteomalacia, um, soft bones, scoliosis, very prominent scoliosis, uh, spontaneous fractures, and so forth. And uh, with Massimo Bottini, we looked at the formation of matrix vesicles in the phospho-1 deficiency, and matrix vesicles are formed in fewer number, fewer number than in wild-type animals, and the matrix vesicles that are being produced essentially lack mineral, and they are much smaller in size. However, with Clark Anderson, we looked inside, and they still have mineral inside. So they're still able to mineralize, even though they are fewer and smaller matrix vesicles. So we thought, are we missing something here in the story? There must be a mechanism that can bring phosphate in, either another enzyme that is involved, or there is a transporter able to bring phosphate inside the matrix vesicles. And that, in fact, led us to work with uh, Laurent Beck uh, here at Nantes University, who provided us with the PIT-1 deficient animals. And when we did the double knockout animals, phospho-1 and PIT-1, we saw that we could severely reduce initiation of mineralization in the matrix vesicles. But only th this experiment was not perfect. We could only essentially eliminate PIT-1 uh, down to 30%, but that reduced the essentially the percentage of field mesicles by, by 70%, so 30% remaining. This indicated that really phospho-1, uh, PIT-1, was involved in the transport of phosphate to the matrix vesicles, providing this alternative mechanism of accumulating phosphate for initiation of mineralization. And then we decided to do one more experiment, and that is what happens if we knock out both the initiation of uh, phosphate formation within the vesicles and incorporation of phosphate by eliminating the enzyme that produces phosphate perivesicularly. And this experiment, I think, is one of the most beautiful experiments we've done in our laboratory. These are wild type pups or, or embryos, 16 and a half day old embryos. Phospho-1 deficiency, you see essentially uh, skeletal defects, but you see the, the axial skeletal mineralized. Alkaline phosphate is deficiency. These animals are essentially normal phosphatemic. These are hyperphosphatemic. Look at the double knockout animals. Zero mineralization of the entire skeleton. Knocking out two different enzymes, you totally abolish skeletal mineralization. This told me that it's really not a free phosphate circulating in the plasma because these animals have normal phosphatemia, hyperphosphatemia. These double knockouts cannot be zero phosphatemic. There is phosphate around. However, they do not mineralize. So the phosphate needed for mineralization must be produced perivesicularly and then incorporated via phosphate transporters. So this was a very clear experiment in my mind. Uh, one pup out of 272 born pup had a partially mineralized axial skeleton. And we thought, well, there must here be a backup phosphatase. Could NPP1 also serve to produce phosphate in these cases? And indeed, uh, ENPP1 is better expressed in the, in the spine versus the leg, so in the axial skeleton than in the appendicular skeleton, and can probably produce enough phosphate to allow this, uh, this embryo to partially calcify the skeleton. And uh, with, uh, in collaboration with Pietro Ziancaglini, an expert in, in, in membrane biology and in liposome technology, essentially we studied the, the role of alkaline phosphate as EMPP1 in, in a biomimetic system, matrix vesicle biomimetic system, and the conclusions were very important. Alkaline phosphate is the most potent ATPase in matrix vesicles, and EMPP1 at the level of matrix vesicles produces phosphate, not paraphosphate, acting as a backup phosphatase, okay? So that explains why this, this uh, embryo was able to partially calcify uh, in, this, uh, in this genetic experiment. Uh, and recently, uh, Luis Andrilli from, from uh, Pietro Ciancarini's laboratory confirmed, once again doing my, uh, liposome studies, proteoliposome studies, that alkaline phosphate and EMPP1 need to be at equimolar concentrations in order to correct paraphosphate levels. Um, so this is the basic mechanism, that, that are the basic data that led to the understanding of this mechanism. I'll show you a little bit about what happens to osteopontin. Uh, in collaboration with Mark McKee, Mark McKee looked at matrix vesicles of stage, uh, stage one, 
stage two, uh, where they begin to mineralize, and stage three, where hydroxyapatite begins to perforate and be exposed onto the extracellular matrix. And he stained these sections with uh, labeled antibodies to osteopontin, and the results are quite dramatic. You see that only stage three, meaning where hydroxyapatite is exposed onto the extracellular matrix, bind osteopontin. So as soon as the crystals poke out of the matrix vesicles, osteopontin binds to it immediately. And, and it participates in the, the control of extracellular matrix mineralization. Uh, so the Harmi in my laboratory said, OK, what happens if we knock out osteopontin and alkaline phosphatase. Are we going to improve the skeletal phenotype? Alkaline phosphatase in knockout animals have high paraphosphate levels. If osteopontin contributes by suppressing osteopontins, we should be able to improve the skeletal phenotype of these knockout animals, and indeed, that is what happens. The double knockouts here have improved skeletal condition compared to the hypophosphatasia mice, the lack of alkaline phosphatase only. And in fact, the, the, the levels of osteopontin correlate with the severity of disease in our animals animal model of hypophosphatasia. Uh, and, and osteopontin, as I said before, is a substrate uh, of alkaline phosphate. It's a very highly phosphorylated protein, and there are two sites, at least, that are dephosphorylated by alkaline phosphate. So alkaline phosphate is really uses phosphosteopontin as substrate and essentially establishes a phosphosteopontin-osteopontin ratio. So this is what we know so far about initiation of mineralization, and here briefly I tell you what we do not understand. We do not understand very well the biogenesis mechanisms of matrix vesicles, how are they produced uh, in the cell. Phosphate may be involved in the control, uh, SMPD3 may be involved, phospho1 is certainly involved, but exactly how this takes place and is regulated we do not understand. And we understand very little how matrix vesicles help propagate the initiated mineral onto the collagenous matrix. Uh, matrix vesicles bind to collagen fibers. How do they bind to collagen fibers? Uh, we have a couple of candidate molecules, one of which is, of course, alkaline phosphatase. Another one is annexin. And in collaboration with Pietro Ciancaglini's group in Brazil and Mark Hoyler's in Leuven, we've looked at annexin-5 and alkaline phosphatase. Both enzymes, or both molecules, have the properties of binding to collagen. So they could be anchoring matrix vesicles onto the collagen fibers, allowing the propagation onto the extracellular matrix. Uh, but there is uh, more to the story, perhaps. And now, uh, in collaboration with this, uh, um, with this group, Massimo Bottini uh, in Italy, René Boucher in Lyon, uh, Pietro Ciancaglini, Ana Paula Ramos uh, in Brazil, uh, we are exploring this idea that perhaps matrix vesicles are cloaked by a protein corona. And this is not new. This comes from, from the nanotechnology uh, uh, field. In fact, viruses and, and, and nanoparticles are cloaked by, by circulating proteins. And this could very well be true by matrix vesicles. And those proteins that may be adhering onto the matrix vesicles as soon as they are exposed could help them uh, bind to the collagenous matrix. We are exploring that paradigm. So I think this is all I'm going to tell you about the basic biology, how we came to an understanding of what are the enzymes that control uh, inorganic paraphosphate and the phosphate paraphosphate ratio. So now we'll move into hypophosphatasia. As I mentioned before, hypophosphatasia is an inborn error of metabolism featuring rickets, osteomalacia, and is due to loss of function of the alkaline phosphatase gene, tissue non-specific alkaline phosphates. ALPL is the name of the gene. It's a rare disease. Uh, the, free, the, the, um, the incidence varies between 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 300,000. This is more in Europe. This is more in the US. And 1 in 2,500 in Canadian Mennonites uh, in, um, uh, in, the, in this population. Um, so uh, uh, this is a fabulous database that Etienne Mornay initiated here in Versailles and now has been taken over by Wolfgang Hoegler uh, in Austria. Uh, a fantastic resource that he started almost 15 years ago, documenting every single mutation affecting alkaline phosphatase gene. Um, the point in this slide is that uh, mutations are spread all over the gene. There are no hot spots of recombination. Essentially, mutations affecting the function of the enzyme are throughout, throughout the structure. And most enzymes are essentially missense mutations. Uh, that's the majority of the cases. Um, 
The animal model that I showed you earlier is indeed an animal model of infantile hypophosphatasia. This disease can present itself in very severe lethal perinatal infantile forms, less severe childhood, and milder forms, adult, and even odonto HPP, where the only manifestations are loss of teeth. Um, the disease can be inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion or uh, dominant fashion. And based on what I told you earlier, all these genes can be modifiers of the hypophosphatasia phenotypes. These are all genes engaged in the control of the initiation of mineralization. So the status of these genes can potentially affect um, the, the presentation, of, uh, which is very, very variable, and, 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 vari and, and variable expressivity and penetrance. Uh, compound heterozygosity of mutal alleles is the most common forms of uh, presentation of, of uh, the, the genotype. So this is the animal model we developed years ago. The animals essentially are born alive, but they all die before weaning. This is the presentation in humans, very severe presentation, infantile hypophosphatasia, very abnormal skull mineralization, essentially lack of um, uh, calcified bones. This, this image, you will see it again, quite dramatic, just a few bones calcified, all because of the lack of alkaline phosphate, meaning you have accumulation of pyrophosphate and an increased ratio of pyrophosphate to phosphate. That is the culprit explaining this, this presentation. And these are all, uh, the clinical slides are borrowed from uh, Michael White, who is a clinical expert on hypophosphatasia worldwide. This is uh, a case of infantile hypophosphatasia. This, this uh, patient died. Um, this is the presentation of mild infantile form. This is the, 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 the walking gait, uh, typical of this, uh, of this uh, uh, phenotype. Here we have severe childhood. Milder form, but severely affected infant. Here we have mild childhood, easier gait, easier ambulation for this patient. And early loss of teeth. In this case, this child had only manifestations in teeth. Note here that the teeth come off with the root intact. The roots do not resorb. This is characteristic of hypophosphatasia. Okay? Uh, but this child otherwise can run, can leapfrog. It just uh, has no skeletal abnormalities except for early loss of teeth. And Michael White has even described one tooth odontohypophosphatasia. So it can be as mild as one tooth odontohypophosphatasia. So how to try to correct this defect? We, we, uh, we, you know that the defect is due to the lack of alkaline phosphorus to destroy pyrophosphate where it is needed to allow mineralization to proceed. So how to bring the enzyme to where it is needed to allow this propagation to proceed? And the trick came from a collaboration with Enobia Pharma, uh, a small company in Montreal, Canada, in, in 2000. Uh, five and six, that's where he started. And they had a proprietary means of targeting molecules to bone by adding a polyaspartic acid motif, a decaspartate. And they also added an FC region of immunoglobulin to make pur purification easy. Single step chromatography would allow purification of the enzyme. And this adding an FC region would also help with the, with the pharmacokinetics of this compound. And work done in my laboratory shows that indeed the animal model that is completely null for alkaline phosphatase all of a sudden lights up with activity when you inject uh, this enzyme and it homes into the bone. And it binds 32 times better to the to the modified, uh, to hydroxy, synthetic hydroxyapatite than the unmodified form. So this was the targeting principle. And uh, the demonstration is quite clearly seen here. This is done in my lab by Sonoko Narizawa and Manisha in collaboration with Brian Foster. This is uh, an image of uh, enamel, quite interesting. In the wild type animals, you see alkaline phosphatase at the cellular level in the ameloblast, as well as in the odontoblast. That's where alkaline phosphate is normally is expressed. You see no activity in the actual enamel matrix. The enzyme actually goes to the enamel matrix. It's a mineral binding alkaline phosphatase. It binds to where mineral is. It does not correct the cellular defect. It only binds to mineral, and it sinks pyrophosphate concentrations at the mineral layer. That is the therapeutic effect of this enzyme. Does not correct the cellular defect, and that's important to understand. Okay, we are only sinking pyrophosphate at the level of where mineral is. And I'll come back to this uh, later on as well. So what do we expect by injecting this enzyme? 
we expect that there will be a sinking of paraphosphate concentrations, normalization of this ratio, and there will also be a sinking of phosphoosteopontin to osteopontin ratio. So the two inhibitors are going to be essentially normalized when, when, um, uh, when injecting this enzyme in mice. Uh, we don't really know whether it's going to affect the amount of phosphate available or not for incorporation into the matrix vesicles because that probably needs to be done perivesicularly uh, in tandem in combination with these other molecules. So probably this is not going to happen, but this is going to happen. And that is what we have observed, essentially. Uh, this is a summary of old work, but when you have this, uh, uh, these are the knockout animals compared to wild types. Treated animals are totally undistinguishable. This is after 56 days of daily treatment, uh, normalization of the skeletal phenotype. Uh, normalization of the acellular cementum. This is the primary defect that essentially allows these kids to pull their teeth right off the socket with the root intact. Is the lack of acellular cementum. And the enzyme replacement essentially goes from this. This is osteopontin uh, staining, by the way, that to visualize the lack of acellular cementum. Normalization of the acellular cementum layer in the treated animals compared to wild type. And uh, also, we have normalization of some of the skeletal, of, of the craniofacial uh, defects uh, that you see uh, in, in the model. This is very severe uh, skull abnormalities, and they are essentially corrected with treatment. Now, this is true of the mouse model, because in mice, uh, craniosynostosis develops within the first two weeks post postnatally. In humans, it's a different story. Craniosynostosis appears to develop in utero. So this treatment is not preventing craniosynostosis in patients. These patients still need to go craniostomies to alleviate uh, intracranial pressures as, the, as they grow. Uh, so this data I presented at the first meeting organized by Hypophosphatasia Europe in Unang, and uh, uh, Agnes was there. Um, uh, so I think she's uh, oh, hidden over there, I think they were there. <laughs> um, this is the first time these data were presented in public, and it was at this meeting that the clinical trials were, were started. Right there at that meeting, there was a questionnaire being passed on to the patients to see whether they could be recruited to the clinical trials. Uh, Michael White presented, I presented, and these are members of Enovia Pharma, and uh, Steve Ursprung, the organizer of the conference and president of uh, Hypophosphatasia Europe, was there as well. And at that conference is where the clinical trial started. Uh, Enovia Pharma generated a GMP quality enzyme, and it went into the first set of patients. Only 12 patients in total were in the clinical trial. This is some data on the first six, that, that, that started from the youngest boy of uh, less than a month of age to the older girl that was 36 uh, essentially months, uh, a, a girl from the United Arab Emirates. I'll show you some videos of her. Um, these are the genotypes. Um, most of them are compound heterozygotes except for this girl that had uh, cousins uh, as parents, so a, a, a rare case of homozygosity of the mutation, low alkaline phosphatase. Uh, serum pyro pyridoxal 5-phosphate was high. This is another substrate of alkaline phosphate and a very good marker of the disease. Respiratory status was pretty, pretty compromised. They needed assisted ventilation, nephrocalcinosis in all the patients, uh, difficulties walking in all of them, and feeding by two. This was lethal hypophosphatation, essentially. All these children would have gone on to perishing of their disease. And a few, a few images to, to just show the, the, the impact that this therapy had. This is the first baby girl, baby Amy, flown to, from Belfast to Canada to be treated by Cheryl Greenberg, the first physician to ever treat a patient with hypophosphatasia. And these are some images before and after, clear changes from baseline to 24 weeks uh, here and there, also the thoracic capacity. And uh, later on, I have a picture of this baby girl, three years of age, doing very well. Um, th thanks to this treatment. Uh, this is the most severe example of this boy less than a month of age. Uh, look at the images before treatment and just 24 weeks after treatment. This image to me tells the whole story of how profound the therapy is. Going to the mineral, sinking paraphosphate, allowing mineralization to proceed. Quite, quite, uh, quite incredible image. Uh, these are images from when we visited um, uh, baby Dania in the Emirates. This is before treatment. Um, and she was three years of age. That was the cutoff point for incorporation into the clinical trial. Uh, and then we saw her uh, at her fourth birthday. 
The family was there, the parents were there. She was walking unassisted, breathing unassisted, dramatic change. Uh, here we have Evie visiting us at a rare disease symposium. And then four months later, the mother sends me this video, jumping up and down, dramatic improvement on just for a few, a few months of treatment. And here we have uh, the, the poster child of hypophosphatasia, Morgan Fisher, who lives in, in Carlsbad, near where we are. And uh, I met her essentially when she was about to begin her treatment, and we keep in touch continuously. She's doing great. This is a picture of hers uh, in 2018, and now um, the mother, Kate, sent me this video for, for Thanksgiving, so doing fantastically well under the treatment. So this is going from bench to bedside for hypophosphatasia with enzyme replacement. And it went very well, very quickly, and these are the reasons that I like to list. First of all, we had a very good understanding of the pathophysiology of hypophosphatasia. We had an animal model that we had studied for many years. We understood what to look for very quickly in the mouse model to look for efficacy. We had a single-minded commitment by Enobia Pharma. You would say a single asset company these days, uh, putting all the investments into this treatment. Well-documented animal model and also um, our commitment to the, to the work. Top clinical expertise with Michael White, the world's expert on this disease. And then orphan disease status helped up get this, this drug approved. Um, and then the advocacy groups, I cannot emphasize strongly enough how important the advocacy groups have been. First of all, for the initiation of that clinical trial that led to the approval of the first enzyme replacement therapy, but also now as we continue, and I will move on to that now, uh, just to, to keep us informed of what is working and what is not working. So this is the path from concept design with Enobia in 2005, preclinical work in my laboratory, to this clinical study, approval of uh, asphotase alpha, also called Strensic in 2015, for pediatric onset HPP. To this day, there is no approved treatment for adult hypophosphatasia, which remains a large population of patients, and we need to work on that. Um, the drug is also very expensive, so many of these patients are, are excluded from that because of the high cost of the treatment. Throughout the years, I've really valued keeping in touch with the advocacy groups. I've hosted the Soft Bones in San Diego twice. This was in 2018, and you will recognize Evie, you will recognize Morgan here. Um, and also a, a more recent group in, in, uh, gathering in 2019. Again, you will see Morgan there, Evie there. And it's important for two reasons. One for my postdocs that work day in and day out with animal models to realize that the, what they do in the lab can actually impact someone's life. And this is important for them to talk to the patients. We're not physicians. We are PhDs. We're molecular biologists. We work with animal models. For them to talk firsthand with patients is invaluable. And then the patients tell us what is not working. And, and can you do something about this? And certainly one of the things they don't like are the multiple injections, daily injections for the rest of their lives. And these re side reactions can be uh, quite severe, forcing discontinuation of treatments in some of the patients. And the patients can quickly deteriorate if you, if you interrupt the treatment, depending on the initial diagnosis. For the most severe affected kids, they have no backup alkaline phosphatase to fall back on. So they really need these this injections. So what can we do about this? And we're currently trying to develop gene therapy. We started very early on. In fact, uh, Professor Shimada was at the conference in Unang. She, he heard my presentation, and after, afterwards he said, I think there is room for us to come in with gene therapy. And that started a long collaboration. Already in 2011, we demonstrated that a single injection of a lentiviral vector harboring mineral target alkaline phosphatase could treat the mice for life. Lentiviral vector is not a good vector for clinical trials. We, and, and essentially, with their expertise, moved on to other forms, and then associated viral vectors, uh, and then self-complementary AAV. More recently, collaboration with Professor Miyaki, the disciple, and now um, uh, uh, Professor, uh, once, once Professor Shimada retired, we published two papers showing that a single injection of an adeno-associated viral vector 8 carrying mineral-targeting alkaline phosphatase treats the mice for life. And I'll show you some of that data. 
Uh, this was done uh, in Professor Miyake's laboratory, one paper, and this is from my laboratory, focusing mostly on the, on the tooth phenotype. Again, beautiful correction of the acellular uh, cementum phenotype. Uh, these are all the people that were involved. So single injection cures or treats infantile hypophosphatasia uh, for life of the animals. Um, this is the skeletal phenotype. Essentially, you see no difference with wild-type animals and the treated animals. The complete preservation of skeletal mineralization. And then we also have a mouse model of later onset HPP because it is really the adult patient population that now needs help. So can we do something for them? We have two models, essentially a conditional animal model inactivating alkaline phosphorus under control of the PRX1 Cree uh, mouse line affecting mesenchymal stem cells, so mostly affecting the, the appendicular skeleton. And then we have a cold one a uh, knockout animal model that affects the entire skeleton. And using this model, we also show efficacy arresting the deterioration of the skeleton. It's important to understand that once you have skeletal deficits, you will not recover them with the treatment. You will only arrest progression of the, of the deterioration. So uh, as the sooner one starts the treatment, the better it is. But essentially, we can arrest the deterioration of the skeletal phenotype in the late onset model, and also in the phospho-1 knockout on the animal model. I showed you briefly a very severe scoliosis phenotype that is prevented by a single injection as of adeno-associated viral vector harboring uh, mineral targeting alkaline phosphatase. So, so there is uh, a good prospect for gene therapy, and this is where we are now. This is the path that I showed before, 2015 approval of enzyme replacement. We are now working on IND-enabling studies to try to see whether one can move gene therapy forward or not to the clinic. Aruvant is a company that has uh, essentially licensed the vector from Professor Miyaki and is, uh, is advancing this treatment towards the clinic. So perhaps at least there, are, there is the opportunity to go from daily injections of enzyme replacement to a single injection every so often, perhaps every year or every two years or five years and so forth. It's not going to be like in mice, injection for life, but every few years would be a lot better than daily injections of enzyme replacement. Now, there is, of course, always a concern because the therapeutic principle has not changed. We're talking about mineral targeting alkaline phosphatase. How are we doing with time? Okay. Um, and why, why am I concerned? Because the... Alkaline phosphate with a polyaspartic acid motif binds to mineral wherever it is, and even if it is in the vasculature. Wherever there is a hydroxyapatite in the body, it's going to capture, trap that mineral targeting alkaline phosphatase. And most of us are going to develop one of these comorbidities at some point in our lives, either aging, obesity, or, uh, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, atherosclerosis. So what could be the long-term consequences as having a mineral targeting alkaline phosphate is continuously accumulating, possibly at ectopic sites. And, and the physicians are aware to look for ectopic calcification. This is something we need to look also in our animal models. So since we talk about now vascular calcification, let me remind you there are two types, intimal and medial calcification. Intimal calcification is mostly uh, atherosclerosis. Medial calcification is what you see in end-stage renal disease, diabetes, obesity, aging, generalized arterial calcification of infancy, pseudosantoma elasticum, arterial calcification due to a deficiency in CD73, also called calja, calcification of joints and arteries. These are all rare diseases. These are all very common diseases. What these diseases all have in common is an upregulation of alkaline phosphatase in, in the either intimal or medial layers. And this is not good because high alkaline phosphates in the vasculature sinks paraphosphate concentrations and aggravates the, the, the issue. So this is what happens pathophysiologically in these conditions. And you do not want to superimpose a mineral targeted enzyme on top of this process. But this brings me to the last part of my talk, which is really uh, uh, vascular calcification and anectopic calcification. To test the possible role of upregulating alkaline phosphates in the vasculature, we did these animal experiments. We essentially generated a phlox allele uh, 
uh, where there is a stop codon by, by, uh, flanked by log p sites that can be cleaved by different Cree construct. So in one case, uh, by the tackling Cree, we activated alkaline phosphatase in the medial layer of the vasculature, and, and in the other, by type two Cree, we activated in the intimal layer of the vasculature. So both of these layers now upregulate alkaline phosphatase, human alkaline phosphatase. And what are the consequences? Very dramatic. This is what happens to the solidly calcified aorta when you overexpress alkaline phosphatase in the medial layer of the arteries. The mice essentially suffered with this cardiac hypertrophy, uh, very reduced survivability of the animals. They essentially are all dead within 90 days, uh, increased uh, uh, blood pressure and so forth. Very severe phenotype mimicking generalized arterial calcification of infancy. What happens when you overexpress it in the intimal layer of the arteries? Well, something very similar. These are the, these are the heart uh, arteries calcified, more spotty calcification, but also a very severe phenotype. Uh, and uh, uh, Flavia Amadeo in my laboratory looked at both of these models, essentially, with ectopic calcification in the heart and aorta for the possibility of binding mineral targeting alkaline phosphatase, and indeed, this enzyme, which is what we administer to hypophosphatase mice, not only home to the skeleton, they also home to the arteries and to the heart. So the potential there is real. We just need to assess how, how significant it is or not for patients under chronic treatment for the rest of their lives. So from what I told you so far, you understand that alkaline phosphatase is a biologic, a therapeutic biologic, and also it could be a target a therapeutic target for ectopic calcification, because I mentioned that this enzyme is upregulated pathophysiologically in all of this intimal and medial arterial calcification. Can we inhibit this enzymatic activity trying to bring down, essentially, or to bring up paraphosphate concentrations? And the answer is yes. So together with a chemist at the Sanford Previs Center for Chemical Genomics at, at our institute, uh, and these are all the people that have been involved uh, throughout the years, we screened for and identified a very potent pharmacological inhibitor of alkaline phosphatase. This was the original hit identified, and through the work of, uh, through SAR chemical work, identified this molecule that has good pharmacological properties, is orally bioavailable, so essentially you can drink it. Uh, to inhibit alkaline phosphatase activity. It was important um, to develop an assay in plasma that would not um, force the sample to be diluted upon testing if we wanted to, do, to use alkaline phosphatase as uh, a marker of target engagement. In order to measure alkphos, you need to find it in an inhibited form. So uh, El Sergienko developed an assay where in essentially a straight plasma assay, 100% plasma without any dilution. And that would allow us to, to know whether the enzyme was inhibited or not. Target engagement is what we were after. Um, and we showed efficacy in essentially uh, preventing calcification. Uh, we were able to reduce heart size in this animal model without affecting skeletal mineralization. Of course, we want to only touch the upregulated levels in the vasculature without affecting the levels that you need to calcify your skeleton and your own teeth. And this is not happening. We also demonstrated efficacy in a model of chronic kidney disease. In chronic kidney disease, you have this severe calcification developing, and the inhibitor to different concentrations essentially suppresses this high calcium score in this animal model. Okay? So these are common diseases that could potentially be uh, affected by inhibiting alkaline phosphatase. The problem is you do not go into a clinical trial in a CKD model or diabetes model. They're just huge, costly, and few pharmaceutical companies are willing, able to invest uh, the amount of uh, funds that are required for that. So the, the path towards approval in this case is through a rare disease. And this is where pseudocentoma elasticum comes into play. This is a condition that essentially displays calcification of the arteries, medial layers of the arteries, calcification in the skin. It's pseudocentoma. It's not a centoma where you normally have lipid deposits in the skin. It's pseudocentoma. You have hydroxyapatite crystals in the skin. And you have also eye calcification. And this disease is due to defects in ABCC6, potentially an ATP transporter. So ABCC6 transports ATP to the, to the outside of the cells, which is then used by EMPP1 to produce pyrophosphate, uh, and that is how it is involved. 
So uh, during the conference, where also Herve Kemp was invited, uh, Bill Gall was presenting, and we established a collaboration to look at samples that he had um, from uh, pseudosantoma elasticum patients, also GASI and also CALJA patients. And we published two papers, actually, one with Bill Gall's group demonstrating the efficacy of TNAP inhibition uh, in preventing ectopic calcification in this model, and then in another group, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Wito's group, also the same, the same efficacy study. And at that point, we license this compound to Daiichi Sankyo. The first thing companies do when they, they essentially um, uh, license a, a compound like this is to modify it, develop their own compound, and uh, they have improved it considerably in terms of pharmacokinetic uh, properties. And now they have moved into phase one and phase two clinical trials. So these are summary of the phase one clinical trials. They did a single escalating dose and also a 10-day repeat multiple ascending doses. And the results are very, very encouraging. Uh, this is a 10-day dose. And you show here the response in terms of increasing paraphosphate concentrations upon administration of the inhibitor goes up and down. And this is at day one, and this is at ten, day 10. So repeat dosing of this inhibitor day after day leads to the same kind of response, increasing paraphosphate concentrations, which is what you want to do. And th this is the safety profile, essentially very few adverse effects. They are no, not dose dependent. So this was a clear path forward towards clinical trials. And I'm very happy to say that as of November uh, 17th, 2022, we have now begun to dose patients with PXC, pseudosantoma elasticum, uh, to suppress vascular calcification. And this is what, uh, what the dosing is going to be like. For the placebo group, three pills of no drug, for the, the low dose, 20 milligrams, one pill with drug, two with placebo, 40 milligrams, two pills with drug, one with placebo, and then three pills with drug. And these are the groups that are ongoing now. This phase two clinical trials will take the, the year, and hopefully by next year we will start phase three clinical trials in patients with PXC. And um, so this is the path so far. Uh, concept design essentially in 2007, presentation of the work at this symposium, uh, proof of concept uh, in, in, in the preclinical work now has been repeated by Daiichi Sankyo as well. So we licensed the compound 2015, preclinical work until 2017, phase one until 2019. Then of course COVID uh, stopped all of that and now it has been rest restarted uh, in phase two in 2022. So moving forward, even though it has taken quite a bit of time. And now I finish with this slide. Again, we go back from a rare disease to a common disease. This is a very common problem, age-related macular degeneration. And it so happens that there are no good models of, of uh, AMD. Uh, the model that is being used is the, the PXC model, the ABCC6 minus minus model, essentially, which displays calcification in the eye. Um, so this compound could help us also understand Drusen formation in AMD, age-related macular degeneration. So together with Francesca Marassi uh, at uh, Sanford Burnham, she has recently moved to, to the Medical College of Wisconsin. We have a program project grant uh, that, it, that is likely to be funded, and we're going to look, we'll be looking at the pathogenesis of ectopic calcification in the eyes of AMD using the PXC uh, and EMPP1 animal models, and whether this compound, either the SBI425 that we develop or the DS1211 that Aichi improved on, can be used for the treatment of AMD. And with that, uh, I thank you for your attention, and I'll be very happy to answer questions. Y a-t-il des questions dans la salle? Please. Uh, thank you, uh, Jose Luis, for this uh, excellent talk. Uh, I have a question about the pyrophosphate treatment. Pyrophosphate treatment. Um, so, in, in the in the clinical trials that you are trying, is that is that a preventive uh, treatment? Yeah. Because it has been shown in different mass models, for example, ANPP1 or ABCC6, that the preventive treatment with pyrophosphate is working. But in some cases, it's very difficult to cure once the, the, the calcification already occurred. So can you have a comment on that? So you're talking about the, the, or the No, the pyrophosphate. The pyrophosphate. Yeah. 
So, so the, alpha t the asphaltase alpha treatment is essentially preventive in the, in the infantile model. When we use the treatment in the late onset model, once disease has been manifest, you can only arrest progression, but you do not go back. So it's very important that patients are treated as soon as possible, as soon as they are diagnosed. Uh, you really cannot, uh, even the, ch the children with HPP uh, still have uh, lower stature, so they don't completely recover. Uh, to the defects that have already set in. So, important to start as, er as early as possible. What's here? I, I think it's not loud. Yeah. No, 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 no. You, you, you get Thanks. Yeah, it's, it, it's really such a beautiful and amazing story to see this life's work like this. It's, I was very impressed by this. Um, I had two questions. One was, um, for the the earlier part when you're talking about the the vesicle formation you mentioned there isn't very much known about yes. how they form but i was curious kind of how stereotyped they are in terms of the distances between them and um just thinking about you know what what the purpose of these vesicles are is it is it always the same how s widely spaced they are or they do they differ in different tissues or different regions so so the matrix vesicles apparently bleb out from the membrane so they are they're essentially forming out blebbing out how distant they come from the cells i think they probably bind to the matrix as soon as possible the the, the osteoblast chondrocytes are producing matrix immediately so they probably don't travel far at all it, it, it's uh, but in terms of, of w when they arise are they are they always at a specific distance from each other, like one vesicle to another, or? So, in, uh, with AFM, we have seen them nicely lined up, but this could be totally artifactual. Mm -hmm. We do not know. Um, I don't think there are many studies that actually show in detail how do they align. See, the problem is that once they are on the collagen matrix, they get destroyed. They destroy by, this, by the, the same process that they use to initiate mineralization. Because phospho-1 is essentially using phospholipids from within the membrane, so destroying the, mep the membrane from within. It's using phosphoethanolamine, phosphocholine from the lipids in the membrane. So it's auto-digesting themselves as they accumulate phosphate. So at some point, they disappear. They don't exist anymore. But initially, they bind up. And the question is, how do they bind enough to allow that mineral to propagate onto collagenous fibers? And that's, that's the question that I'm interested in. They probably don't migrate very far. They just mm. get, latch onto collagen as soon as they see it, and they begin to propagate mineral. Uh, I have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, so uh, in terms of the um, enzyme replacement, is the, I, I was struck by the, the uh, issues from the frequent injections. Yes. Are, are there possibilities to develop like a depot form of this instead of having to go to gene therapy where it could either be slow released or have right. a longer half-life? So potentially you could have a patch like for, for diabetic patients. So the company, uh, Alexion Pharmaceutical, uh, has not explored that. Um, uh, there, I know they are working on a second generation enzyme replacement. There are very few details available. My presumption is that they have improved the uh, carbohydrate content uh, structure so that they, are, they last longer in circulation. Because a lot of the other enzymes that you replace, you give them much less frequently than this. So. That's, that's right. If you could do that, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these injection side reactions can be very, very severe. Thank it's you, really Phil. Yes. The next question won't be very far. Um, so in a hypophosphatasia, um, do you know if... Um, Patients are also explored for the modifying genes because some of them are not as well respondent to the therapy to others. Right. So the modifier genes that I have pointed out here, phospho-1, um, you know, EMPP-1 and so forth, at least for phospho-1, there is one publication right now associating skeletal defects to one phospho-1 mutation. Um, so... We associate phospho-1 deficiency with pseudo-hypophosphatasia, meaning that the, the ALPL genes are, are normal, there will be no mutations there, but still the phospho-1 deficiency manifests, at least in mice, very closely to like hypophosphatasia. And this is why we did the trial with, uh, with the, uh, gene therapy to show that we could correct the skeletal phenotype in that, in that way. So uh, the, how many modifiers there are? Now? I know that Etienne Mornet published on, on collagen genes as being modifiers as well. So there are a number of modifiers out there that need to be looked at. And it's important to include them in genetic panels like I know you're doing and, and other people are doing. Yeah. And then maybe I have a provocative question. Um, how vitamin D is entering the, the landscape? 
I think unless vitamin D levels are very abnormally low, uh, there is not much of a concern. I think Michael White would answer that you just normalize to the, to the normal range, but uh, not overdose, but certainly not. you don't want them to be low. You don't want to superimpose a nutritional rickets on top of a, a heritable form of rickets. Yeah. So well. I have just a last question. Please, so please. In this year where you have don't matrix vesicles, alkaline phosphate is operating, for instance, in enamel, or in late dentin. So do you think there is a pathway which would be using alkaline phosphatase without matrix vesicles? So it's interesting because it, it, so a cellular cementum is the tissue that is most strongly affected. Yes. And clearly, matrix vesicles are not at play there. So, so there is a distance effect. I think you're right. And the distance effect could simply be changing the phosphate paraphosphate ratio, which then just, just by gradient reaches a stage where it begins to calcify. Yes, what we showed with the enamel uh, in right. your experiment. Right. Thank you. Yes, so thank you very much. It You're was welcome. just a marvelous example. Yeah.